today. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. It's really good to be with you. Uh, our policy briefing is called the uh, graduate income tax, a barrier to economic growth. And I will be introducing Doug Banks uh, of the Boston Business Journal, where he is the executive editor as our moderator, as well as our two fantastic panelists, Jane Steinmetz and Josh Rao in just a second. But let me uh, provide a little background for today's conversation. Um, we're coming out of quick reality. Big realities is that in Massachusetts, we have over 300,000 people that were in the workforce in February 2020 who were no longer uh, participating in that workforce. That's a big challenge for our state and for states across the country. As we refocus on getting the economy working, we have a number of unknowns. Uh, one is we'll continue uh, with the new technologies that have been developed. Uh, there's a new administration. There are new infusions of to the state coffers and more for education. Uh, other states obviously will be having the same. There's discussion also of a transportation slash infrastructure bill. Um, there are likely changes to the tax, federal tax code. There are many other states, including our state, uh, many states that are making big tax proposals. And there's much, much more in terms of open questions. Uh, there are lots of open questions, probably too many for the business community, which thrives on stability and predictability. Uh, on Beacon Hill, one of the proposals, and that's the topic of this conversation today, that's, uh, uh, that's of particular interest to us because it represents a departure from a long standing constitutional framework that uh, puts into place a flat income tax is a proposal to create a constitutional amendment, a constitutional amendment that would apply a 4% surtax on all households and all tax filers who earn over $1 million in a year. That uh, Those earnings include salary certainly, but also capital gains and really any kind of income you can think of. Um, this same effort uh, was found unconstitutional in 2018 in the so-called Anderson case, uh, which had um, one of our partner organizations, the Massachusetts High Tech Counter in the case legislature. And it was approved at a 2019 constitutional convention. It needs to be approved by one subsequent uh, constitutional convention that may be in 20. 21 or maybe in 2022, but if approved, it would go to the uh, ballot in November 2022 to ensure a full vetting. Pioneer and partner organizations have been uh, deeply involved in analyses, trying to educate policymakers and the public. Uh, we've released six studies thus far on the topic. We have 14 more coming before the end of the spring or maybe the start of the summer, uh, covering every aspect. Uh, of this question, including uh, wealth flight trends, uh, telecommuting, the impact of um, the in impact on specific industries, lessons learned from other states, California, where uh, Josh Rao is from, or where he works today. He's actually a Newton. He's a Newton boy, um, and uh, lessons also learned from Connecticut, uh, where they've had a history of uh, high earnings taxes. Uh, so uh, we are really pleased to have two fantastic experts on the topic of taxation. Folks who have thought deeply, researched deeply, have. Um, their daily activities intertwined with questions of state tax policy, but also relating to um, things like uh, wealthy, how the wealthy think about uh, moving uh, in or out of this state, uh, their investment um, strategies. Uh, our two panelists are Jane Steinmetz, who is well known to our Boston business community. She is the office manager, managing principal of Ernst & Young. And Josh Rao is a professor of finance at Stanford University, and they will be engaging in a discussion moderated by Doug Banks, again, executive editor of the Boston Business Journal. And I will now jump off the screen and let three very handsome folks jump on instead. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate that. It's, uh, it's good to see good Josh here and Jane. Um, Jim has set the stage for us very well. Uh, I would, so maybe we'll just, uh, we can just launch right in, but before we do that, I'd love to just have you folks let our audience know a little bit more. Um, I think most folks, uh, as Jim said, 
know you, Jane, as the managing principal at the EY's Boston office. They may not know that you're a tax partner by background. Why don't you give folks just a little brief sort of um, snippet of some of your, your tax background and some of the work that you've done on state tax policy. And then Josh, you can go right in, as he mentioned, um, you're a, you know, you got your PhD at MIT, you're out at Stanford now, love to hear a little bit more about some of the work. I know you're an expert on state and local pension systems, but maybe you can go right after Jane, just talk a little bit, just for a minute about sort of what, what brings you here, and then we'll get right into it. So Jane. Great, thank you, and I'm glad I'm going first. I don't know if I want to follow Josh and his uh, esteemed uh, background. So as you mentioned, I am a tax partner. I've been a tax partner for 25 or so years, um, but my specialty is state and local tax. So during that period of time, I really focused almost exclusively on state and local tax uh, matters for high net worth individuals, for businesses. Throughout my career, um, I had just a deep focus in Massachusetts because that's where I was based. Um, and in, you know, some of the matters that would be covered would be those of tax policy. So that's actually my favorite piece of tax is the tax policy piece. And, um, how powerful that can be in uh, training economies. So, yeah. Thanks, Jane. Josh? Okay, well, great. Thanks very much, Doug. That's great to be here and, and sharing the stage with, with you and Jane. Um, as Jim mentioned, I actually uh, am a Massachusetts native. I, I grew up uh, in Newton, uh, and um, I got my PhD at MIT, so I spent many years uh, in Boston in the surrounding areas. And I lived in uh, Chicago for eight years after getting my, my PhD and uh, learned about the public finance challenges that the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois faces. And then I moved to California uh, to work at Stanford in, in 2012 and learned even more about the challenges that the state of California faces. My, my work and my research has been on the topic of public finance broadly, and there have been two main areas that I've studied. One is, as you mentioned, Doug, state and local pension systems. And the other is the impact of state and local tax policy on decisions that are made by individuals and companies, um, either to move or to reallocate their business activity to, uh, to other states. So uh, great pleasure to be here um, talking about these issues in the context of Massachusetts, and maybe I can share some of what I've learned by uh, looking at other states. Absolutely, we're looking forward to hearing that. Um, and before we before we get to that, I'm going to start with you, Jane. Um, mm -hmm. We did open this up to questions from the audience. So if you register, you were uh, asked if you wanted to submit a question. We got a couple of those, and then we have a chat function here. You're welcome to submit questions. We will. I will be going through them, uh, and then at the end, uh, in probably about 40 minutes or so, I'll uh, we'll we can ask some questions from the audience. But uh, one of the questions that came in through the registration. System also happens to be one of the questions that I wanted to start out with because we've been here before. As Jim mentioned, a similar petition uh, was struck down by the state's highest court in 2018. And so my question, Jane, if, if you don't mind getting us started here, moving forward with this particular initiative now, and by now, I mean, of course, over the next year or two by the time this book gets uh, accepted if it does and implemented if it does. Yeah, I mean, I think through COVID-19, and now we're coming out of it, and there's largely a reset button being hit. And again, Jim mentioned some of the points, but work from home. You know, I was just on a call, and everyone's talking about, will we go to a hybrid model? Will we require people to come back five days a week or some days a week? Um, and then during this pandemic, one of the things that I found interesting is tax collections. In the beginning, we really thought that tax co collections were going to be slashed. Um, as it's played itself out, 2020, we came in $120 million short in Massachusetts, which is close to break even, but it's still a shortfall. 2021 seems to be doing fine uh, based on where we are in projections. Same for 2022 based on projections. So in that why now? I think legislatures have to think about, are, we need to help people who need the help. That's, that's def 
definitely something we need to do with this surtax needed to do that. Um, another thing that we really have to watch closely is the federal tax rate structure. You know, we're, we're talking about this 4% surtax, but when individuals are thinking about their tax bill, they're thinking about it in totality. So as these tax proposals move forward at the federal level, um, the Mass Legislature has to really watch them and analyze how those potential increases might impact what a surtax could do here in Massachusetts. And then um, the economy. So I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I am just as interested as somebody else as to what the economy is going to do. I don't know if we know, but what we're hearing is um, a bit rosy. It may, be, um, it may be false. We need to see it play out, but we're hearing this, there's gonna be a hockey stick. We're hearing we're going into the roaring 20s. Um, is that true? We, maybe we need to see over 12 months what's fact versus fiction. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is the federal funding. Um, so we're getting some funds from the federal government. And so with those funds coming in, again, it could play into the mass legislature's mindset of is now the right time. But importantly, with the federal funding comes restrictions. And the restrictions would say that if Massachusetts takes the federal funds and uses them, then you cannot directly or indirectly lower taxes. So it's a real important decision for the mass legislature to make about do we move now or do we kind of pump the brakes a little bit and move forward maybe 12 months from now and see how this reset works itself out because it would be hard to adjust taxes on a go forward basis if we think that's needed because of the use of- And I definitely want to come back to the idea of the federal funds because there's so much to, uh, to really dig into there. Before we do that, Josh, um, in, in the introduction and then even just in your opening remarks, you talked about what you, so before we talk about the federal impacts and some of the things going on there that might affect Massachusetts, um, I think a lot of folks in our audience would like to hear about the California's experience with uh, graduated income taxes. Um, they've been through this and the question is, and the question that most folks here don't know is whether a tax hike of this kind will in fact create a behavioral response. In other words, will people for the services that is uh, that they expect will happen? Sort of what's what's been the experience in California um, writ large? And then well, if thanks very much. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's, that's a great question because I think the, the the best way that any state that's considering a policy. Um, can uh, try to sort of benchmark what might happen is to try to look at what's happening with other states. Try to keeping in mind that every state situation is 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 different. That the back the backdrop is always different. Um, but in in California, um, in 2012, the uh, there was a referendum that led to the introduction of a um, graduated income tax. Before that, there had been a flat tax above $50,000 of, of 9.3%. And then the ballot new tax brackets above that of 10%, 11%, and 12%. And there had also been in place since uh, the middle of the first decade of the 2000s, a, uh, a 1% millionaire tax. This uh, referendum did was that it, it, it is the top paying up to 13.3%. And that's a that was a pretty big increase. Uh, and it also um, took in some people who not, not only the, the millionaire folks, but also people still earning a, a lot, lot of money who would be in the, you know, the top one or 2% of the income distribution, um, earning between, uh, say, 500,000 and a million. So, um, so it took in a, a, a fair number of people. And, and I was fortunate to be able to get uh, the to be able to get some data to be able to analyze what the the response was of high earners because there were the state itself was basically not really predicting much of a response uh, by individuals and indeed you know there are many people in surveys who say that uh, California is the greatest place to live and they would never leave 
Uh, but when you look at the when you look at the data of what actually happened, uh, we found a couple things. First of all, there was a big spike in departures of high income people in the couple of years after Prop 30 happened, relative to a sort of baseline rate of departure. The, the, the rate of departure doubled. The other thing we found that had maybe even more of an economic consequence was that for people who stayed in California, were high earners, their income growth really leveled off. Their, their reported income growth, the income that they were reporting to the tax authorities really leveled off compared to the income growth that we saw from taxpayers who were located in, in, in other states, but who were comparable to these taxpayers who are in California. And, and on balance, what we found was that within a couple of years, around 60% of the state's expected windfall revenue gain from this tax increase was actually eroded away by this combination of people leaving and also people, high income earners apparently reporting less income to the state, which could have been due to a number of things, but better you know, tax planning, more tax avoidance, uh, more for people who have, uh, or individuals who have multi-state um, LLC businesses shifting their the composition of their businesses to other states are still digging into the exact reasons. But the bottom line is that the state didn't bring in as much income as, as they had thought. I'll, I'll wrap up by saying, you know, people reacted to my study in a few different ways, actually. S some people said, well, this is great news. At least the state was able to bring in 40 cents on every dollar of what they were expecting to, 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 to bring in. Um, I don't look at it quite as, as, as optimistically, in particular because now we're facing an environment where, uh, as I know we'll talk about, uh, the state and local taxes are, are capped in terms of the extent to which you can deduct them from your federal tax return. And so what that means is that since 2018, when this federal law changed the, the, the taxation of, of uh, the federal taxation of, of, of state and local tax deductions, the federal treatment of state and local tax deductions. Um, the, the spread between what you have to pay living in a high tax state and a low tax state has gotten even higher. So that I, I come to the conclusion that at least in California, um, further tax increases are actually very unlikely to bring in more revenue. And in other states, what I would say is that they are unlikely to bring in as much revenue as the authorities project, because authorities typically do not consider these behavioral responses, which are big, and that that's a, a, a major consideration uh, uh, to, to keep in mind. Thanks so much. Jane, do you have any thoughts on that, just in terms of what he was talking about? Sort of, you mentioned the bigger picture. Uh, when, they, when people think about their taxes, they think about it in totality. He talked about state and local tax, for example. I mean, you guys have forgotten more about taxes than I'll ever hope to know. So maybe there's other aspects of taxation, whether it's the estate tax or the federal reduction in, in, in state and local taxes, that uh, some of those things that might, that might be applicable here in Massachusetts. Maybe yeah. you can expand a little bit on that. Sure, sure. Well, first, uh, Josh, that information was really interesting. I do remember when California raised its um, rates, what typically happens when a state raises or proposes to raise rates as a state tax practitioner, we get calls and they'll say, hey, can you analyze what my tax costs will be if I go to one of these lower cost states in relation to what it will be if this tax hike goes, goes in? And I remember the calls I got with California. Um, some people left, some people stayed, you know, spouses, kids, whatever, kept them in, in the state, but it, it did get people thinking. Um, and, and to your point, Doug, you know, you really, in, in an analysis that I mentioned, it is a total analysis, right? So it's not just personal income tax to personal income tax. Like you really have to look at the, the overall tax regime in a state in comparison to the tax regime in other states to which an individual or business might go. So as it relates to Massachusetts, um, so the surtax would bring us up to about 9%. So that, that's on the high side, um, some of that really on the highest side um, of, of the states. But there's other aspects the Mass legislature should consider in analyzing whether to move forward with this and, and whether they should be adjusted um, before moving forward. So one, a state tax. Massachusetts has an estate tax, which is um, really a minority of states have them. It's the highest rate of 16% over a state's worth uh, more than a million. We also have a short-term capital gains tax rate 
of 12%. So if you add 4%, it will be 16%. That's quite high. I mean, that may need to be adjusted or, if, or they should think about it because that would be a very high rate uh, when combined. Then we also have a tax on S-Corps. So S-Corps, you know, small corporations, only so many owners, they are typically a flow through structure, only one level of tax uh, with, with generally. Massachusetts has a tax on the entity level of S-Corps. Um, so those types of, you know, the totality of the mass tax regime would have to be considered along with, as we were talking about before, the federal tax impact and any changes there, like the SALT deduction, the state and local tax deduction, the federal rates and the like. And I just want to go back to the restriction because if the legislature decides it is in the best interest to move forward with the surtax, whether or not some of these other aspects need to be adjusted should be considered but the use of the federal funds may restrict our ability to do so because of this restriction that says, if you take the funds, you can't use the funds to reduce your state taxes. And um, I just don't know how that's gonna be mapped and tracked. So that could be a, uh, you know, a, a, a hindrance to making some adjustments. And you had mentioned the S-Corps. I know the Business Journal, when this was a hot topic in 2017, 2018, we looked at a number of businesses in Massachusetts whose uh, owners are, you know, they're S-Corps. These are multi-million dollar businesses in some cases. And the people who were principals of those S-Corps were claiming the, they were claiming their taxes through that S-Corp. So they were coming out as millionaires because of the value of that business and that S-Corp. At least that's my understanding. I'd love, can you help, under, help me understand a little bit more um, sort of the relationship between a, a person's S-Corporation, their business income, and then their personal income? Because I think I'm, if you take out the business income, does that affect whether or not they are actually considered millionaires or does this hurt their ability to, to grow their business and hire more employees, uh, thus expanding the tax base itself? And of course, Josh, if you have thoughts on this, I don't even know if I'm asking the question right, but go ahead. Yeah, I think I think what you're getting at is that, you know, when you're a business owner and you have flow through, it could be a partnership, it could be another flow through entity, that flow through of income is going to, going to come into your taxable income calculation. And, you know, if you've been, I don't know, growing your business and then all of a sudden it pops and you're, you're finally turning the, the corner on um, scaling up and getting more income, it, it could move you into this surtax. I believe that's what you're getting at. Right, right. And then of course, the question becomes whether or not they're able to continue to grow, hire more people, create more income. Josh, are we? Does that make sense to you? Is this something you've seen, or can you talk to to this? Yeah. So this is a, a, another study that I've that I've done. Actually, uh, looked. Uh, this is a study that I, that I published in 2019. It looks nationwide at state level income taxes and uh, considers both the corporate income tax and the individual income tax. And for that study, I like to work with big data sets. So for that study, we were able to get a data set that, that, that actually had employment at every business establishment in the United States. So really, really rich data. And what we found there was that when uh, there, was a, there was a substantial response of corporate business employment when states raised corporate income tax rates. But there was also a very substantial response of pass-through business employment when states raised the personal tax rate. And I, and I think Jane did a great job of, of, of covering that, uh, of, of what exactly this means. But you know, the, the, the bottom line is that there are a lot of businesses out there. They used to be smaller businesses, but now they're, they're it can actually be pretty sizable businesses that, that, that choose for a variety of reasons, um, pass through tax treatment, meaning that they're, they're not gonna organize as a, as, a, uh, as a corporation for tax purposes, they might do it for other legal purposes, but for tax purposes, they're gonna be recognized as a, as a pass through entity. And so those owners are gonna, they face the individual income tax. So when you raise the individual income tax say in California from uh, you know 9.3% plus one to 12.3% plus one, um, on mil, quote unquote, you know, millionaires. Well, you're you're also raising the the income tax rate on the, the business of that of that that individual who is you know who is who is employing individuals and creating jobs. And we see a very big employment effect. And and this just gets to one other point I want to make, which is you know a lot, maybe people hear the discussion and think, gee, you know, high income people these are millionaires. Who who really cares if you know if they leave or they reduce their income? Does it does it really matter? 
The, the fact is that it does matter for a couple of really important California, and I think this is going to be true in Massachusetts, uh, but I don't know the exact statistic for Massachusetts. For, for California, the top 1% of, of taxpayers uh, provide around half of the total tax revenue. So the state is super dependent upon these individuals to, 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 to fill its coffers. You don't want to kill the goose that, that's laying the golden egg. And then the, the, the other point is that when, when there are job losses associated with people like that moving their business activity to, to, to other states, that might not affect the, the you know, State Department of Revenue's coffers, but, but that's something that we should care about a tremendous amount because that means that, that, means that jobs are, are lost in the state and we're losing economic dynamism. You know, there's this whole discussion around this idea of what's called the Laffer curve, which is this idea that, you know, this question of if the state raises its top income tax rate by one percentage point, how much more total revenue does it does it take in? Does it does it take in 100 percent of what it would expect or do people change their behavior so that maybe even if you raise taxes enough, they don't actually bring in bring in anything? Um, and, I, and I think that's an important discussion to have because it's a re revenue discussion, but, but, but also sometimes gets lost in that. What about economic dynamism? What about jobs, just jobs as a, as a, as a measure? And so that other study that I did was focusing more on, on jobs. And I, I, I do think that uh, the evidence shows that uh, raising um, individual tax rates hurts job creation by past through entities. Well, I think that's a great place. Why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because I know some studies that a lot of the uh, have there's been a lot of attention on studies here in Massachusetts that suggest that this millionaire migration is a myth, if you will. Um, you know, and, and then there's you know, others that wonder if we raise the tax rates, will it even result in the uh, revenue that the state is expecting, right? So they, they build it on certain models. Uh, you mentioned one of, uh, you know, if we raise it this much, we'll bring in this much. And we had big numbers being thrown around billion dollars here and, and there and you know to to jane's point we're in a very different place right now economically where predicting is so much harder so is there a possibility like talk a little bit about whether or not it's even possible the state could raise what it hopes to raise based on what you've seen uh in some of the the research that you've done and then jane you'd love to hear from you as well yeah. on this the uh, sort of how do we maximize that state tax revenue um at the right point What's the inflection point, Josh? Well, I, I definitely want to hear from Jane about what, you know, the, the, the types of um, clients that she's working with are, are, are saying about this in the, in the Massachusetts context. Um, you know, in, in, in the context of states that, I, that I've looked at, I, I think that the key is that the revenue, the revenue departments that are making the projections almost never build in any what we're calling behavioral response. They don't think people are going to leave the state and they don't think that high earners are going to find ways of reducing their taxable income or reallocating their their income to other states and you know the evidence shows that they that they that they do that i think also uh, before turning over to jane i'll just say that you know covid has and and the and this rise of remote work has really um, uh, you know uh, agree with what with what jane said before this is really throw, you know changed the way that uh, changed the landscape in 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 many ways. Um, you know, a number of California companies in 2020 left California. Major major companies uh, moved their headquarters, uh, like Oracle, Palantir Technologies, Hewlett Packard, and you know, were taxes the only reason? Well, no, no probably not. But they did all move to much lower tax states. And and I think that one thing that with this rise of remote work. You know, we're now in a situation where um, people, you know, the, a lot of workers have been working remotely from other states anyway, uh, in, you know, in, in, in part for tax reasons. I know that Massachusetts and New Hampshire are involved in a very uh, engaging and important uh, dispute right now about this very question of how telecommuters are, are, are going to be taxed. I, I think those are the types of questions that, that are going to be very informative um, and are going to determine, uh, to some extent, whether raising these top income tax rates would even be successful at increasing revenue. Yeah, I know this is really the most hotly debated question um, on this topic is the degree to which state taxes will get individuals to leave the state. And the proponents and the opponents of a graduated tax or a surtax, that's usually the, the focal point of the um, debate. You know, will you really see people leave? 
And so as Josh meant, there's lots of studies out there. And um, I was looking at some of the studies done by the Mass Taxpayers Foundation um, a couple of years ago in analyzing this tax. Um, and Connecticut can be a um, litmus test as, as can California. Um, and, and some of the stats were interesting. So when you look at Connecticut, uh, four years before it had a tax increase, about 20,000 individuals on average were leaving the state. Four years after it went, jumped up to 48,000, which was 8.8 um, .8 billion in adjusted gross income, leaving, leaving Connecticut. And then in 2011 and 2012, I believe this came from the IRS, 27,000 individuals left, 10,000 of which went to Florida. And so I will say that Florida, um, I don't know if you hear it as much in California, but Florida is always brought up. Like how many people are gonna go to Florida? Well, Florida is a plane ride away. New Hampshire is a quarter of a gas tank. So we have to like really think about that case, you know? And you know, one of the things that this case that Mass and New Hampshire have going on right now is it's kind of highlighting that New Hampshire is cross border, no tax state. Um, so what's going on with Mass and New Hampshire is Massachusetts, um, you know, most likely temporarily, but we don't know, during the pandemic said, well, look, we're just going to keep status quo. If you live in New Hampshire, but prior to the pandemic, you were working in Massachusetts, we're going to continue to tax you as if you were working in Massachusetts. Um, New Hampshire has taken issue with that, and there's now a court case. New, one of New Hampshire's arguments is that Massachusetts is impinging on New Hampshire's sovereign right to, to be a no-tax state. And according to New Hampshire, it's no-tax status is what attracts people and businesses to its borders. So this, with you know, one, in its brief, it's basically saying Massachusetts is now disturbing my ability to attract and retain residents and businesses as a result of tax New Hampshire residents working in this, you know, using Connecticut as an example, knowing that New Hampshire is next door, what, what's going to happen? I mean, does, do New Hampshire residents, if Massachusetts loses or goes back, back to its um, usual role, will New Hampshire residents say, I'm going to work from New Hampshire more often because it's going to lower my tax bill to Massachusetts? That has a trickle effect of just use of restaurants and the like in Massachusetts. And then will others, maybe they have two homes, start to defer to New Hampshire as their primary residence. Maybe they think to relocate there. Those are the types of questions that really have to be analyzed with the benefit of lessons learned in other states um, and all the studies that are out there. Uh, definitely mass legislatures have to think hard about that. Yeah, I think we should stay on this topic a little bit just because there is that, you know, the Supreme Court case, um, whether or not uh, it's it's unconstitutional for Massachusetts to, uh, to to have to have this. What, so I'd love to, Josh, I don't know if you can talk a little bit more about what you might see or what you've seen as the implications of this, the idea of a graduated income tax change if if telecommuters are not subject to to Massachusetts income tax, if they're living somewhere else or commuting from somewhere else, what that might look like. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, in, in the California experience uh, in, in 2020, I think is, 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 is very interesting and may, may be informative uh, here. California, if, if, if you could establish that your domicile was actually changed to another state, then, then even if you are, even if an individual is, uh, uh, deriving income from a California company, they would not be uh, taxed by by the state of California. So, the, so, so this would sort of be the 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 you know the situation um, uh, if if New Hampshire won. And what have we seen? Well, it's it's interesting because uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, some people will, po will point to Silicon Valley, where I'm where I'm coming to from today here, and say, well, look, you know, th things aren't that bad here. You know, employment over this horrible year 2020, from like end 2019, December 2019 to December 2020. If you look at the statistics, you know, employment in the Silicon Valley areas of San Francisco, San Jose, maybe add Silicon Beach to that. You know, LA, uh, LA has been worse, but S Silicon Valley has been like almost flat. And some people have said, okay, this is in such a catastrophic year, this isn't so bad, but you know what, it actually is really bad. And, and the reason it's really bad is that Silicon Valley is a, is a technology center. You know, it's a major technology center of the United States. And COVID, uh, while it was a horrible negative shock to so many parts of the economy, was actually a huge positive shock to, to technology and technology companies. I mean, just look at their share prices if you, if you have any doubt. And so the fact that employment was only flat in this area during this year was actually a catastrophic outcome for the Bay Area. And where is the employment gone? If you look, if you look where the employment has gone, for example, if you think about sort of adjusting for what industries, you know, places are, you know, the, what, what industries are, 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 are hot or are big in, in places, you know, California then looks terrible. And the places that look really good are some of the places you've, you've heard that people are moving to, you know, Austin, Texas, obviously huge, um, but also, you know, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Indianapolis. So it's, it's, not, it's not all, you know, places that you've heard of as being the hottest places where folks are going. Um, but, you know, the fact is that technology, employment in tech is, is, you know, is stagnated in California. It's way up in these other places. So I think the bottom line is just that one has to expect that there is a lot more fragility um, than, than one might think. And I, I'll just say there's a recent survey that was, that was published in the, in the, in the um, uh, San Francisco newspaper where two out of three uh, tech workers said they would consider uh, leaving the Bay Area. Uh, not, it, wasn't, it wasn't about the state, but the Bay Area. Um, and I think a lot of them were thinking about going to other states um, if they could continue to work uh, remotely on an indefinite basis. So that, that's, that's really helpful, you guys. Are, this is great. I want to poke a little bit on some of the other um, aspects that, that, that Jim even brought up. So we talk, he, talk, he talked about capital gains and the report that you know, the Pioneers done one talks about capital gains tax as being impacted by this. I don't know that people really think about a millionaire's tax as something that might affect the middle income earners or lower, even lower income earners. But in a state like California's Bay Area where houses are so expensive or Massachusetts where houses can be so expensive. I mean, is, 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 is housing, is capital gains? What are the, what impacts would there be on, you know, lower or middle income uh, earners and, and possibly, you know, jobs that are, you know, could be affected? I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of the, the people that may even be trying to help. How will they be affected by this? You know, um, that is a really good question. And the premise, I would assume, of this surtax is to take from those of higher means and redistribute that to folks of lower means who may need it um, more. So with that as a backdrop, we wouldn't want the surtax to apply to what would be maybe one-time milestone events. Um, where people are trying to accumulate wealth through home ownership or otherwise, you know, it, to me, um, maybe that that would be unintentional. But as written, it would apply to that. Um, but that gets to something that I have been saying since this has been um, floated: is as a tax practitioner, I do not think it is good tax administration to have a tax provision etched in stone in the Constitution. If it is decided that we're going to move forward with the graduated tax, so be it, but it should be done, in my opinion, a little more clean. So we have Article 44 of the Mass Constitution, which says you need effectively uniformity. That needs to be repealed to have a graduated tax. So repeal that and then put the, the actual tax provision 4% tax on income over a million dollars in the personal income tax regime. That is chapter 62 of the Mass General Law. That's where all the other tax provisions are. The reason being is that when you have a tax change, there are these unintended consequences. As it's making its way through the tax returns and fact, fact patterns, you typically have a technical corrections bill. Right? 
So you would enact something in July, it would be retroactive to January 1st. There's some unintended consequences. You hope to have a special session in November, technical corrections bill, which applies back to January 1st, it's corrected. That's typically how it's done. If we etch this in constitutional stone and there's these unintended consequences, you can't just amend the constitution. It could take four years. Um, so if it goes forward, and that is the decision, I, I feel as if we should um, think about how this is put within our laws and really think about having it as a provision versus a constitutional provision because of those unintended consequences. So what you're saying, if I hear you correctly, is that by going through the constitutional amendment route, however it's written, whatever that language looks like, if there's any possible unintended consequences, which by the way, there almost always is when it comes to bills and laws, um, mm -hmm. there's no way to go back and fix it the way you would a traditional bill and law on Beacon Hill. You would, because, because of this, the, the two year process of each constitutional uh, convention and then the amendment process could take four years, uh, that's really interesting. Josh, is this something that you've looked at in some of your research? Yes. I mean, I, this is a very important point because um, the unintended consequences can only be addressed after the fact, if there's some, if there's some flexibility there. And, and this ties into what Jane was talking about earlier as well about the, this restriction with the federal funds uh, that, you know, you can't, uh, cut taxes um, uh, if you're going to receive federal funds. You, there's a restriction on how many years you can do that for. And you know what what would count is it would would that run afoul? Would a correction that that you know to, to to fix an unintended consequence could that run afoul of of of, of that provision? And so I I, I think uh, that's another another sticking point in in trying to address these things on the on the capital gains point. I'll just say like you know, Cal California taxes capital gains at the ordinary income tax rate. So the so one time windfalls are absolutely you know going to be taxed at that at that top rate, uh, and the federal government sounds you know has there's been a proposal to move in that in that direction as well, uh, and what this does end up doing is you know it 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 means that if there is a one time you know someone who's built up a million dollars in their in their business over the course of their of their entire career. Uh, you know, and, the, and, and maybe they, they haven't built up much in the way of retirement savings because they poured their life savings into this business, um, you know, they're, they're going to be uh, uh, paying that tax, at least that, that marginal uh, tax rate um, if there's that higher rate put on. I, I'm not sure that we necessarily would, uh, that, would, would, would that that would be desirable. Um, so, so, Jane, are we too far down the road then? to uh, in this process to be able to shift or is there a way that the proposal as it is structured now can be adjusted to avoid that um, that impact on potential middle income earners and you know what I mean I think most people even those who are you know dead set against it uh, or or I should say for it um, might not want that to happen as well right is there is there anything that could be done you mentioned one process I think yeah, you know, the way that it's written, um, the uniformity clause remains in the Constitution. So I, I think that's where it gets clumsy, because if the uniformity clause remains in the Constitution, it's hard to make adjustments that would create non-uniformity, right? So right now it's going to be, you have the uniformity clause, but then there's an exception, 4% tax over a million dollars. Um, if we want to make these adjustments, uh, it's, it's, it'll be interesting. And, you know, I'd have to think about the process for doing that. Do you start all over um, with, a, you know, a, um, constitutional conventions to amend? But I honestly think that's how it should be done. I, I am just as a tax practitioner. Well, that brings me to what may have been perhaps our opening question, because it's the one a topic that everybody's talking about, which is COVID and the economic fallout that we've already experienced and how that might affect this whole, this whole effort. Um, you know, I don't, I remember the, in the couple of years building up to that, you know, um, the court striking down the initial attempt, this was a topic that was discussed a lot. Uh, I've not heard it nearly as much, although there was a study, um, I think in January that showed 72% of voters in Massachusetts approve it. Um, perhaps that's just the way the question was, to your point, 
Um, you know, do we tax the rich to pay for, you know, for education and transportation, both of which need help? So perhaps that's it. But do you think that the timing of COVID and the economic shutdown and everything we've been through um, affects this process? Does it make things um, harder, easier? I'd love to hear your opinions and either of you can, can start. Um, you know, it's a really good question. Um, it, it could be analyzed differently by legislatures versus the public. Um, someone in the public realm could vote based on how it impacts that individual person. Uh, the legislature or elected officials, you know, I think they're looking at more of a big picture here. Um, you know, how is it going to affect the state? So in terms of the economic fallout, uh, as I mentioned before, we've been on this crazy roller coaster ride. Um, and as the legislature is thinking about this, it's all the points that we raised before, but um, you know, they need to make the decision as to whether this is needed. And if it's needed, um, that, that'll dictate their decision. But is it needed um, given everything that we talked about before in terms of what's going on. Where is the economy? Where is the economy going? Uh, what are the federal rates doing? What are the federal funds doing? Um, if we're getting the federal funds, do we want to do this at this point? Um, so I think they have a lot to think about there. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, a, a few thoughts. Um, so for, first of all, I, I do think that uh, uh, pu public opinion often tends to focus on just the, the the first step in the economic chain, which is okay. You know, high income people, uh, of which you know I, I as a voter may not be, are going to be taxed and resources are going to be distrib redistributed for important public purposes. Therefore, this sounds like a good idea. the The problem is that one has to really think through the entire chain and. To the extent that it's going to impact employment in the state um, in a negative fashion, which my research shows that it does, one has to be really careful about 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 that that logic about the first step. You, you need to, you know. So I I, I very much hope that um, uh, that that le legislators and the public, when making uh, these decisions, will, will have at least some um, some informed views about what negative impact of this kind of um, uh, high, high, high level of income taxation is going to be on the on the state economy more broadly, um, and not simply assume that it's just all free money that we can we can just take from rich people without there being any any consequences for everybody else. Um, another point that I think is important uh, to think about is you know what, what what's the money going to be used for, and um, it's it's very uh, to give a, a, just a, what what happened in California. You know the the Prop Thirty that that tax increase was was passed um, with, with strong voter support. And a big piece of that was because the state uh, said, we're going to use the funds for education. The funds are gonna to go to school districts. And so, and that was a big selling point of, uh, of, that, of that proposition. What happened was the, the funds did go to the school districts, but at the same time, the uh, state increased the contributions that school districts had to make to the state teachers' retirement system, so to the pensions, the pension fund that that funds teacher pensions, which had been quite underfunded, and so what ended up happening, the the, the sort of bottom line net result was that there wasn't any any really, you know, school districts didn't feel any additional any major additional resources coming from this tax increase. They they were given that money, you know, in in one pocket, but then they were, it was taken out of their out of their other pocket to fund something, teachers' pensions, which was. A state responsibility to fund that the state hadn't been meeting, and so I, I think um, it's worth understanding in the context of, of Massachusetts. You know, what are some of the places where this money could go? And 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 just remember that the place where the statute says it's going isn't necessarily the place where it ends up when the money's been 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 finally moved around um, from place to place. Well, and you anticipated my question, which was exactly that um, when we talked to him. We talk about the education and where this money would go. In this, uh, in this case, in Massachusetts, it would be education or transportation. So what you're saying is that in California, you didn't see better education outcomes. Students aren't doing better. They didn't. It ended up just being that the pension fund got rebalanced or just got an infusion of, of funds. Is that is that what I'm hearing you say? 
That's right. Well, what happened was, you know, school districts got the money on the one hand, but they had to give the money to the to the pension fund on the on the on the other hand. And so the net result has not really been truly increased funding in any real sense to school districts. And, uh, you know, California, I mean, you know, look, we're coming from different worlds as far as the education systems are concerned. I mean, California is routinely in the bottom five of the state rankings of educational outcomes. Massachusetts is is is, you know, routinely number one. So I, I think, um, and you know, that may reflect some different governance structures. So I don't wanna necessarily just apply the, uh, the lessons of California to Massachusetts, but I, I do think the general um, point, point to be aware of is that, you know, just because it's gonna be said, you know, it says we're gonna spend it on X, you know, you can, you can the, the state could still at the same time pass other regulations that, that, that actually, you know, would, 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 would undo that. And we would want to make sure that that wasn't going on, if, if, if indeed that's going to be the basis on which voters are going to be convinced to, to vote for this. Well, that's a great point, Jane. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about what we're seeing at state, uh, at the, in, in terms of state funding. So you talked a little bit about sort of the fiscal situation and tax collections at, at the state level. Um, but now that we have, um, you know, President Joe Biden, we've got a lot of federal funds that are being queued up. Um, billions in transportation are coming our way. I mean, the, uh, you know, governor was uh, just said, you know, just came under fire for, you know, um, for having the MB, you know, the MBTA was going to cut services at a time when they're actually going to get a whole bunch of money from the federal government. They've now reversed that stance. Um, I'd love to hear from you on sort of whether or not federal funding could uh, make this whole point moot or not. I'd love to hear, maybe you can talk about that. Sure, you know, I just grabbed a piece of paper because I, 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 there was a presentation the other day of the federal funds that came in. And I, I honestly, there's, there's so many different buckets, it's hard to keep it straight. But if I was to summarize, um, there has already been federal payments into the state directly to individuals and businesses, whether it's PPP loans, whether it's federal stimulus checks. Um, when you start adding this all together in all the different buckets, it's somewhere between 30 to 50 billion. Then we have four and a half billion coming in to the state um, directly for some of these uses. So we, we needed this. I mean, so I'm not saying this is the panacea and the solution, but it was funds that have been given into the state and it gets to the question of, do we need um, additional taxes for that? And the legislature really has to think about this um, in, in terms of what we've received, what we are receiving and what we need given the picture that we think the um, economy is going to be facing. And, um, you know, it's funny, I've seen some of the questions that were coming in too, and the, the thought is, we have a great state here, you know, would people really leave? And I mean, I love the state, you know, it's got the four seasons, it's got the, the ocean, um, but there's other nice states too. And so I, I really would impress upon folks to look at the data that's out there. Um, in, in some studies, it would suggest that in, uh, I think it was 2016, of the top 25 highest tax states, they um, experienced, 24 of them, experienced a net out migration of individuals. So 24 of the top 25 highest tax states. And then conversely, of the uh, 24 states that had the lowest tax rate, they had a net in migration, 17 did. So you just got to look at this data and understand whether or not taxes are going to move the needle so that um, will we get, the, I think it's two to $3 billion of additional revenue into the state. That all has to be analyzed. And, and on the funds, it, 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 I, I think this has to be scored again. It was scored some time ago, but the surtax is supposed to bring in somewhere between two to $3 billion and I want to say it's to pay, um, you know, for education, transportation. That's more in the line of seven and a half to eight billion. So I, I agree with what has been said in that could these funds be used to pay existing budgetary expenses in education and transportation to free up other funds for other things? Um, yet to be seen. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know, Josh, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that the federal money that's going to states, and I guess the Massachusetts case, four and a half billion, I mean, that alleviates some immediate pressure um, for major budgetary action. 
uh, not just for Massachusetts, but for, for a lot of states. Um, I don't think one can expect that money to come in every year. I mean, this is supposed to be a one-time one -time thing. Um, there are some questions in my mind as to just the future of fiscal federalism in our, in, in our country. You know, how, how will, will there be continued infusions of, of cash to states? You know, if, if, you know, last year was the, the disastrous COVID year, but now this year, even though coffers, you know, the, the revenues in a lot of states have recovered, we're still putting a lot, sending a lot more money. You know, when, when actually does one say, okay, now we're, we're going to stop this versus when does it almost sort of crystallize into, 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 a, into a permanent program and that that is a, a major consideration i'll also say that i mean look you know we're we're, we're kind of uh have been speaking as though um the these quote-unquote necessary amounts are uh uh something that could not be um there's that there's no other source to find them from other than fees and and, and taxes and i i do think you know one has to look at various pieces of uh the of of, of government uh, expenses uh, particularly around things like, um, you know, uh, re retiree health care and and uh, uh, for for public employees and um, these uh, the the way that the the expensive ways that, that that public employee pensions are structured in ways that don't actually really lead to to better um, you know better better outcomes or even make make people happier than some other, you know some other less expensive ways that the state could could fund them and I, and I think that that I mean I was just in a panel the other day about New Jersey and they're asking you know there's similar similar questions, uh, you know, the, and, uh, but at the bottom line is that this, this additional money that's coming in from the federal government this year sort of removes the immediate urgency to, to, uh, to, to do something, either on the cost or the revenue side. Thank you. We are moving very quickly to the end of this, but I did want to, uh, you can probably see in our chat, we're getting a couple of questions here. One that was asked uh, that echoes a similar one that came in at the beginning, uh, uh, registration. So let me just go straight to this audience question, which is, uh, to, to the point that you mentioned, Jane, Massachusetts has a unique ecosystem of world-class financial services, healthcare, biotech, uh, high tech. Um, we've got the Cape. We've got you know the mountains in New Hampshire and Vermont nearby. We've got the coast. So, what do you say to politicians who believe these unique advantages keep high earners in businesses here, no matter what? Whether so, in other words, look, we can charge them as much as we want. We can tax them because they're going to stay because Massachusetts is great for all of these reasons. Um, you know, what do you say, what do you say to, uh, to politicians who, who believe that? I would say proceed with caution. Um, so I mentioned early on that one of my favorite areas of tax is it's a tremendously powerful tool. It can get people to do things or not do things. You know, it could be an R&D tax credit. It could be sin taxes on, on tobacco and the like. Uh, so I believe tax policy moves the needle. Um, so in uh, embracing that philosophy, be very careful because, you know, when you think about it, we're having this conversation and Josh is providing great information about California. California is a beautiful state. I mean, just beautiful. The weather is amazing, right? Um, yet Florida is having this just expansive growth. So, you know, you have to think about what's, driving their, their two states that have a lot to offer from a, like a sunshine perspective. One doesn't have an estate tax or um, personal income tax and it seems to be going up higher. So I, I just think it has to be analyzed and um, philosophies have to be challenged uh, with, with the data that's out there. Mm -hmm. And Josh, if someone was to call you up and say, what would you tell Massachusetts politicians? What would you tell them? I mean, look, you know, look at the look at the evidence. I mean, the the evidence is that even in beautiful, great states, uh, individuals and businesses do respond to the to these. And I, I think you know the the work the the, the, the the California evidence is 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 really unambiguous here. Um, and it is always a question of the interaction of you know the the the, the tax with the, look, the with the good things about the state. I mean, I th I think you know again you know. So California has this weather and this beauty that that, that, that Jane alluded to. Massachusetts is also be be beautiful, um, a little bit colder. But you know th that that weather is, tends to tends to keep people here. But the the the, the big thing that, that you have that I mentioned before, the California doesn't have. You know, Massachusetts really has you know out, outstanding education, outstanding education system, and um, so that's your that's like your that's your major advantage. Um, the question is, is that 
uh, and then the other things you mentioned, will those things be enough? And and so I think you know California is a is a, is a, is a setting where uh, despite you know many great things about California and also many not so great things about California, but taking it all together, people still responded very much to these tax increases, and I think we'll continue to do so. And I, I also think to just keeping an eye on what's going on with the federal policy is incredibly important, both in terms of these uh, the money that will come from the federal government, and also uh, the way the federal government will treat state income taxes with the state and local tax deduction. That's just very important, you know. That's a that that is the 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 that cap that was put on that. That is a massive uh, introduces a massive difference between um, the cost of living in one state versus another state. Uh, we have reached three o'clock, uh, so we've we've hit our time limit. Are, do you have any parting thoughts for our audience before uh, before we close this out? Any any closing comments or anything you want to leave them with? You know, I, I, I think a lot of it has been said during this. I, you know, I want nothing but the well-being of the state to persist. So um, I really um, understand the, the incredible decision that the legislature has before it and the timing of that, um, whether it moves forward, it has to really be um, something of, of, of reflection for the legislature to think about, you know, to, is this the right time considering where we stand? Josh, any last words? Well, I, I, I think we covered a lot of great ground today. I, I would just add to what I was what I was saying before. I, I, I would just add that, that it's also very important to keep in mind that you know at the end of the day, it's not only the the success metric is not only how much how much revenue the state brings in. The success metric is ultimately the economic well being of the state and of its citizens. And you know the the the, the uh, Department of Revenue, you know, the, the, the impact of, 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 of jobs may not be imme the immediate, um, uh, you know, uh, immediate lever for the Department of Revenue, but that, that is very, very important. If, if you're losing jobs, you're losing economic opportunity for individuals. Uh, and so that's a, that's a very important trade-off to be aware of when, when making these decisions. Well, uh, Josh Rao, Jane Steinmetz, thank you so much for being here. On behalf of Jim, who will not be uh, coming back on, I will just say to our audience, thank you so much for your, your questions, your participations. Hopefully we answered uh, all of the questions that you brought and I'm sure the, there's many more, but uh, for now, thank you very much for being here and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thanks guys, bye-bye. Thank you so much everybody.